message number 15 in the book of James, and we are coming to a conclusion, a very important chapter um, in the, the Word of God and certainly in the book of James. James, as we come, is, is telling us this morning what does hearing and doing really look like. He says, you must be one who not only hears the Word, but is a doer of the Word. Being a doer of the Word infers hearing, but it goes beyond hearing. As we were um, working on the school this week, someone said, Pastor, I'm here to serve, I'm here to work, I don't want to just be an auditor. Um, you remember we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. When you audit a class, what do you do? You come and you participate in the class, but you don't do any of the work, right? And you're not even tested by it. Well, there are many auditors of the gospel. There are many people who hear the gospel but yet they don't embrace the gospel. They don't do what the gospel says. They don't truly come to belief and to surrender to this gospel and to following in that. Well, this morning we look and we say, what does it look like, um, the, the hearing and the doing of the gospel? So James chapter 1, and um, in the review, I want us to notice the review before we read the passage and uh, then we'll jump right into the passage. Notice the review there and fill these in with me. A repeating theme in all of Scripture is the necessity of genuine, sincere, humble faith toward God. That is a repeating theme, Old Testament and New Testament that we come to a faith in God. We come to God and place our trust in Him, not in ourselves any longer. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, we see God working with individuals, and we see God working with His nation, His people, the Hebrew people, that He's going to bring salvation to the world through. We see Him teaching them, have faith in Me, not in yourselves. This is an overriding passage, an overriding principle of the whole Bible. Human beings need to come to see who God is and who we are not. That it is He who can save us, we cannot save ourselves. And this is God's message to us gently after millennia, after millennia, after millennia. He is teaching this truth right up to 2016 as we're here in the midst of a nice warm summer in South Florida. We are studying and seeing what his word warns and what his word says. Look what it says in the next one there. Throughout scripture, we see that there are saved people, three types of people. We see that there are saved people there are lost people, and there are lost people who think they're saved people. Do you all get that? There's saved people, there's lost people, but there's also lost people who think they're saved people. And this was a problem in the Old Testament. If you remember with me that throughout the Old Testament, there was this great divide between those who are going to do what God says and those who are not going to do what He says. Those who are going to trust in God and those who are not. Other, sometimes they would turn away and worship other gods. Sometimes they would turn away and run after it. And, and there were certain ones that whole generations of them would not turn back to God. And they were, they were lost. And they, were, they died under the condemnation of of their sin. But we know that there were also people in the Old Testament nation of, of Israel and even outside the nation of Israel, some who had come to believe and some who had come to see this God of Israel that was the one true God. And they would come and they would follow and walk in his ways. They would place their trust in him and that they would, they would seek to observe not only the law but the sacrificial system that was pointing to a Messiah, their only hope. And they lived by faith, and they obeyed by faith. If you go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, if you were to go there and just look at that, you don't need to turn, but if you were to go there, you would see Old Testament example after Old Testament example after Old Testament example, men and women trusting in God, having faith in God, and they were obedient. They were obedient in obeying God. But we also see that 
in the Old Testament, as there were some who were supposedly thought that they were right with God, but just did not honor God, did not know Him, they were self-deceived, Jesus shows up on the scene, and Jesus shows up warning, you confess me with your lips, but you deny me with your heart. You do not do what I say. You have not been changed by the truth of who God is. Your hearts are not transformed. In fact, you have all the religiosity that's there. You're very religious people, but you don't love God. And it's seen by the fact that you seek to simply keep the law for your own pride, for your own selfish gain, for your own misguided sense of faith, and your hearts are cold toward God, and your hearts are cold toward your brother. You don't know God. This is a problem that Jesus deals with extensively. Notice here with me, like Jesus, third one here, Pastor James is also very concerned about this issue. You see, James is writing to Jewish Christians scattered throughout the world, not just the Mediterranean world, but the the whole world under the um, influence of the Roman Empire and even beyond outside the Roman Empire, and even to present day for us, over the last 2,000 years, because God's word is for us, it is timeless, we are in the same, um, really in the same biblical era as the readers of James and as Pastor James himself. James is concerned that people have come into this new movement of followers of Christ and they don't yet get it. They're religious, but they've never been transformed. They're religious, they like the ideas, they like the here, they, 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 they like the messages, they like the community, but Jesus has never transformed their heart as they have held out and not obeyed in surrendering first and foremost their minds and heart and faith, but also their obedience. Pastor James deals with this in several different ways. Fill these in. Pastor James represents several tests or presents several tests that are quite serious. Their first one is the test of trials. What do you do when trials come? Are you trusting in God? Do you bring um, to God your trials? Do you look to God for wisdom in dealing with these trials? Do you see that God is working in the trials? Do you trust God anyway, even though there's things that you don't understand and things that hurt? And then he talks about the the test of blame, that when you're tempted, are you like Adam and Eve who quickly start shifting blame and turning blame to other, other places? Even the people of God in Israel would often shift blame. They would look and they, they would blame pagans. They would blame their leaders. They would blame others. And in this present moment, we come to this place where we can either recognize that we have a sin problem and the the problem is squarely centered on us or we can continue to to blame perhaps our parents or blame um, our boss or blame some circumstance of life, even an abuser, and and we, we stay in our pain and we stay in our sin instead of bringing it to Christ and finding our all in Him. And so there's three examples of this hearing and doing. Now, these verses close out the end of the chapter, chapter 1, and we're going to go back and we're going to read 22. Uh, You know, by the way, you always, if you're you're new to reading the Bible, here's a very important important comment for you. You need to always remember the context of the verses that you're reading. You need, to, you need to know where it fits in the whole narrative. Um, that is one of the reasons that study is so good. That's one of the reasons that wider reading is good. To kind of flip open the Bible and go, okay, right here. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without waver. I mean, you know, and we, or we flip it open and we say, then Saul, David, David said to Saul, the elder daughter of Meribah, I will give you for a wife only a valiant, be, be valiant in me, the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against it. And, and we can read a verse and we go, what does all that mean? The way that you find out what that means is that you read the context. And as you read the context and as you read the surrounding part, you, you come to much greater understanding 
in prayer that God would speak and that God would work. So look with me in verse, we're going to read our context in the box on the page, uh, or our text, our main text is verse 26 and 27, but let's read verse 22 to be reminded of the setting of verse 26 and verse 27. In verse 22 is the key theme of this mini-series within a series of hearing and doing, and we see it in verse 22. But be, what does it say in verse 22? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. You remember I held up the, the big piece of metal, um, the, the polished piece of metal, it, just like a man who would have a nice polished piece of bronze, silver, or even gold, and would look at that mirror and, and immediately forget, as soon as he puts down the mirror, what kind of man he was. The person who hears the word of God and walks away from it unchanged, is just an auditor, just hears but doesn't want to do, doesn't want to believe, and there's many that are like that, there's many that are intrigued, but they're not, in, they're not surrendered in their intrigue. So look what it says in verse 24, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what kind of man he was like, or what he was like, in verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of what? Liberty. You see, this law of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ, and Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free from the bondage of your sin. Free from the bondage of all that holds you back from being who God wants you to be. When we come to Christ and we find faith in Him and we place our faith in Him, the Son sets us free. It's the law of liberty. So he says, Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, so here's that doing, perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, and I love this, he will be blessed in his doing. I love that little phrase at the end. God is going to bless your obedience. He's going to bless your efforts. He's going to help you obey. If you will just come to him and let him work in your heart, he will help you live for him. I love that. God, God is on our side. He is on your side. He will help you in the obeying. Now comes verse 26 and 27. We want to just unpack this this morning very quickly. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, hey, there it is again, deceives his heart, Remember verse 22, deceiving yourselves. See that up at the top, verse 22, deceiving yourselves. Look at verse 26, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is what? Worthless. Worthless. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. As a freshman at Florida State University, I remember reading that passage as I, was, as I was working through and memorizing the book of James. I just remember when I came to verse 27, I was gripped by this statement of what is real faith. If you really want to see real faith, if you really want to see true religion, true religion that is, that is not rejected by God, but that is accepted by God. We, we find these statements that call for a great sincerity and devotion. And we're going to see what that means in just a moment here. But um, let's just, let's just kind of remember. In verse 26, look at verse 26 with me, and I want to unpack this just a little bit. If anyone thinks he is religious... If anyone thinks he is religious. Now, this is at the bottom of your sheet. I want you to see this. The word religious there is an adjective. If anyone thinks he is, and then there's a descriptor. It's an adjective. If anyone thinks that he is religious. Now, this is kind of an interesting word. Um, you see the HL there? HL stands for hypox legomena. Hypox legomena means that this word, this, this particular word, the word religious in this form, it only shows up one time in the entire Greek New Testament. It doesn't show up anywhere else. It's only, it's only one time right here. 
It's a, it's a rather rare word. It shows up as a noun in another place, um, the religious, as opposed to someone being religious as an adjective. Now, wh why is that important? Well, as we, as we go back and we look at how the word was being used at the time of this writing, fill this in, just kind of notice here, um, maybe underline this, it was used by Josephus, who was a historian. He's not a biblical historian. Um, he's outside the Bible, but he was a historian, and he uses it to describe, fill this in, or, or underline it, temple activity. The ceremonial sacrifices, the Jews, Josephus would say, were performing their, their religious duties. They were performing their religious activities around the temple, dealing with the sacrifices, going through, dealing with the, the, the money that was brought in, dealing with the, the various sacri animal sacrifices that were brought in, dealing with their widows and dealing with the people that they were supposed to be taking care of. This was all about their religious activities. Now look at the next part here. The noun that is used in Acts 26.5 um, talks about religious ceremony, that these are the religious that, that Paul is speaking of, that there are religious people. So they, they're not t he's not talking about Christians, but he, he's talking about Jewish Pharisees and Sadducees who are the religious, that are wound up with their religious activity. You see, the idea is the outward show, fill it in, of religious activity. What James is concerned about is that in 2016 there's going to be a church in Hollywood, Florida that's been going for 55 years and as they're going along there's going to be people who come into that church and they're really religiously involved, they're active, involved. They, they come, they give, they talk, maybe they even serve sometimes, but they've never truly come to faith in Christ. And just like God was concerned about this with the Old Testament believers, and Jesus is concerned about this when he shows up on the scene. Pastor James is writing to say, you can, you can go do all of the right things and still not be transformed. He's concerned about that. He's concerned that you look good and you sound good, but your faith is not right with God. Because you see, man looks on the outside and sees all of the things on the outside, and we're very tempted to, to look and compare ourselves to others. But God, we know, knows the reality of our heart. He knows what's going on in our heart and mind. He knows the devotion of our, he, our heart. He knows whether or not there is submission to Him and trust in Him and obedience to Him from the inside of the mind and the heart or whether it is an outward facade. And James is concerned about that. Well, look with me on the back side of your sheet. We want to see three examples that he gives. And they are very powerful examples of this. Um, let's read the passage again. It's on the screen in front of you. And um, I'd like to ask you if you would, and you can, you, if it's easier for you to read off your paper, you may need to flip it back over. But let's read aloud verse 26 and 27 very quickly, and then we'll, we'll just see these three examples that, that he gives. Let's read verse 26. Are you ready? If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, notice the screen in front of you. I want you to see there's three, there's three examples of this obedience that he's talking about, and he's going to pop it out and help us to see it. Look at the first one. The first one is the tongue. Do you see that up there? He brings up the tongue. Wouldn't you rather him bring up something else besides the tongue? I mean, the tongue's hard to tame, isn't it? Does anybody perfectly have their tongue? Does anybody always say the right thing? But no notice this. He's talking about the tongue. 
Secondly, he's also talking about visiting orphans and widows. What, where is this coming from? You're going to see in just a moment what that means. And then he's also talking about keep oneself unstained from the world. What, what, what does that mean? What, 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 is he, what is James getting at on this monumentally important issue of sincere faith? I want you to see it and fill this in. Example number one that he's going to give is the tongue. Go ahead and fill that one out. Example number two that he's going to give is loving others freely. Loving others freely. And you're going to see why when we start talking about widows and orphans, that's the case. And then number three, he's talking about loving God devotedly. Loving God devotedly. And that's living a holy life, to live holy. So let's first look at this tough one up there at the top, the tongue. Look what it says in verse 26, right at the top of your second side of the sheet. But he does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. You see... The tongue is very, very important. It's such a small, tiny little part of your body, but it has more impact possibly than any other part of your body when it comes to the outside of you. Is that not true? I, I think the most powerful muscles in the body are your quads um, or perhaps, I, I don't know, the backside of your legs and, and going up the backside of your legs. I mean, when you talk about being able to lift the most amount of weight you, you get that big uh, uh, squat bar on, and you can lift, lift the most weight by using these very powerful muscles. That's why when you run, there's nothing that exerts the body more than running. From what I understand, to run fast and having all of this moving, lots of muscle moving at once, lots of muscle moving under great strain, you burn more calories, you get tired faster. It, I mean, it is, it is quite a powerful part of our body to have these powerful legs that we can, that we can move by, that we can lift by, that we can, we can go fast by um, to some degree. But the tongue is a very small muscle in the body, a very small part of the body. And it's, it's incredibly powerful. You can move more with the tongue through your words than with your quads in your physical effort. You see, ideas trump... I, I can't use the word trump anymore. Ideas <laughs> overcome... I, I'm going to try to just use the word trump anyway, and it doesn't matter. Because it's such an appropriate phrase. I, ideas are just greater than the physical universe around us. Override. Thank you, Mr. Torres. But uh, here we see that this, and, and we're going to see it in chapter 3 a whole lot more because he circles back and he deals with the tongue. Because the tongue has so much to do with what's coming out. Now, does the tongue speak out of the abundance of itself? Does it have thinking within itself? Is there little servos within itself that dictate what it's going to say? Is there, is there brain cells in the tongue? No, the tongue is, is a result. What Jesus speaks of in this, in this greater issue, the tongue speaks only of that which is in the heart. And we could say in the heart and mind, but it, it has to do with the, the soul of a man the soul of a woman, what is down on the inside of who you are, the tongue reveals. Numerous places in Scripture, this basic statement is made. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, you can go back and read 43 and 44, but look at Luke chapter 6, verse 45 on your outline. It says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How many times have you heard someone say, oh, he said that, but he doesn't mean it? You know, a wife making an excuse for her husband. Or a husband making an excuse for her. Please, she's, you know, she, she just says that, but it doesn't mean anything. Oh, no. I, I mean, I remember as a youth, I had gone with a, a friend up to North Georgia 
and we had gone to take a truck up there and some other things up there, and I was just privileged to kind of go, and they lived on a lake, and we were there, and the grandpa was there, and I remember that he, when we were getting in the car to, to fly back, we drove the truck up, and we were getting in the car to fly back, I, I remember that he got turned around at the airport, and when he got turned around at the airport, he got mad, and when he got mad, I remember this nice little Baptist guy went berserk and all kinds of foul language came out of his mouth, upset at everybody, as he couldn't find his way in the airport and couldn't find his way around. And his wife the whole time was making excuse, excuse, excuse for him, saying, he doesn't mean that. The boys don't listen to him. He doesn't mean that. Well, Jesus said, no, he meant it. See, your words reveal what's going on in your heart. This is a hard thing for us to recognize and to realize. You see, our words may, may be part of that thing where we look at God's Word and it's like looking in a mirror and we, we look back and we see our sin. And when we look to God and when we hear Jesus say things like this, that the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart, we come to realize, oh, that's in my heart. That's why I need a Savior. I, I, I just want you to see this and fill it in. The tongue is a window to the heart. If you haven't already filled that in, the tongue is a window to the heart. It's what allows you to look in there. It's kind of like, you know, the oven. You got the oven and you, you, it's really hot in there, and you, you, you can't get in there very easily, you know, but you got this little window, and you can look in there. A few years back, I went aboard a nuclear, re, I mean, excuse me, a nuclear submarine, and while we were on board taking the tour of the nuclear submarine, they allowed us to go back to the reactor area of the submarine, and it was amazing. It was the coolest thing. And I mean, it was just sitting there, and the reactor wasn't, it, was, it wasn't really online very much. They said, oh, no, you never shut off a reactor. It's still going. But we went back there, and everything's clean and perfect, and, you know, everything's wonderful. And they, they allowed us to look through these little round windows, and you could see down into the reactor. It was really quite astounding. See, it, it, you can't really get into the heart very much. You can't get in there and mess around very much but you can catch a glimpse of what's in there by what comes out of our mouth. Jesus said this. Now, I, I think some of the greatest concern, and I, I've made a list of here, and I, I hope I didn't miss yours, but uh, I, th there's a list of, of things that are of concern here. <laughs> the first and foremost one on my mind is the idea of lying. Why? Because God is truth. God cannot tell a lie. He will not tell a lie. And listen to this. He calls us to live in truth. He calls our lives to be truth. That's why telling the truth is such a big deal to God. It's not a big deal to humans depending on which culture you come from, in some places, even, even telling a lie is to, be, is to be esteemed. To tell a lie and to get away with it is a, is a, is a, a sign of, of great status and intellectual prowess in certain cultures, maybe even the American culture, um, I think, based upon the political reports in these last hundred years. But the, but the picture is, is that when we lie, we are, we are going against the very nature of God because He is a God of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the, what does He say? The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I'm the true way. Um, what about cursing? This, this little muscle that, and this little organ, I guess, that, that has been put within us can either bring a fountain of blessing or it can bring what? A fountain of cursing. 
And you, you say, you mean profanity? Yes, I mean profanity. Profane words, no doubt about it. But also pronouncing curse upon others. Have you ever thought about this fact? When you say damn, excuse me, I'm not going to assume that you say damn because I don't say damn. But when someone says damn, do you know what that means? Damn is short for damnation. In fact, there's, there's evidence in early English um, language history that you, you can see that, that they would even use the curse word damnation to walk around and damn. Well, what does damn mean? It, it, we, we get it right when we say, or the, the, the idea is consistent when you say God damn. When someone says, God damn, the idea is, it is God damning that to hell. That's the picture. To damn something. You see, sometimes somebody would say, damn it. That means, damn that thing. We have heard before, damn you. When someone says, damn you, what are they saying? Go to hell. It's the same thing. So when, when someone expresses damn, it's talking about damnation. It's talking about cataclysmic curse. And when you say, God damn it, what you're saying is, may God send you to hell. All of it short. Now let me tell you, when I was about eight years old, my mother went through the list. She heard me say something. We were in a 1964 Volkswagen Beetle. And it was right over here on the corner of Thomas Street and 40. When I heard my mother say every word that I was, I was never allowed to say. And she explained what they all meant. And damn was one of them. You see, our words mean things. And when we begin to look at lying and cursing in vulgar sensuality. You know, when, when a woman just is always kind of talking about the things that are sexual and always talking about it, you say, women do that? Yeah, women sometimes do that. Some, some women do. More likely with men. When men are always commenting on human anatomy, when men can't stop their eyes from undressing a woman in public in their mind, these are the kinds of things that begin to reveal. And, and the mouth betrays it. When someone is constantly speaking in sexual innuendo or in vulgar, vulgar sensuality, you see, what we're seeing here is that what's in the heart is a sensual, licentious preoccupation. Very often that goes right along with either pornography or just outright immorality, adultery, fornication. Those things go together very often. What about the other one there, gossip? Speaking negatively of others or talking about others behind their back, talking about other people's business that is not necessary, is not related, is, is very often in a negative light. That is dealt with very seriously in Scripture. And there are certain cultures that are more prone to that than others. The more close you are to a puritanical culture um, or part of the Protestant Reformation, it's less likely because the gospel really did change those cultures. So they, they tend to do that less if that's not part of the heritage of the culture that is there, then there, this idea of, of gossip and manipulation, I also have on here, the next one there is manipulation. This is a big one. Um, there are some people that will just say something in order to cause a response from to somebody else. They will manipulate by what they say. It sometimes is cause, seeking to cause, it's a solicitating a, a, a compliment or solicitating a response. 
Now, there's some of that that's normal within conversation, but it is possible to be someone who, who has fallen into the trap of verbal manipulation over and over and over again. And so either it's with words or the withholding of words at key moments in order to cause others to feel a certain way and then do what you want them to do. Sometimes it's simply to inflict pain. Christians are not supposed to be manipulators. Christians are to speak clearly and openly with their confidence in Christ. Their identity is in Christ. They're not, they're not trying to get other people to like them based upon what they say or based upon what they do. They're accepted in Jesus. And there's a great freedom in that. Even when you mess up and even when something goes wrong, you, you do that. Pastor Tom, you, you all have heard me talk about Uncle Tom. He has a whole sermon entitled The Curse of Words. When he comes this fall, I ask him to share it with you. He, t- he, just, he unpacks how sometimes we live our whole lives under a curse that was said to us somewhere along the way, and we're trying to live it down. Maybe it was an ongoing thing that was said to you over and over and over again as a child, or it was a key moment somewhere along the way in growing up or even in adulthood that someone said something, and you're seeking to live it down. You see, that, that, that's where manipulation comes from. There are many sins of the tongue. You may never utter a word of profanity and yet have great sin of the tongue. Jesus is saying that our, tongue, our, our tongues result, it, it, re, result in, in showing us the condition of our heart. It, it, I, I have others that are here. There's too numerous, and we, we could keep going. Insults, negativity, destruction. That's a, that's a criticism, just being critical of everything. That's just tearing people down, tearing things down. You know, it's so easy to criticize. It's, a fool can criticize. A fool can look at a problem and articulate it. But God calls us to be creators, not destroyers. God calls us to be builders, not those who disassemble and wreak havoc. How about this word that's a little strange word there, insatiability. Your tongue can reveal a heart that's insatiable. What do we mean by insatiable? You just write down there below it. Cannot be satisfied. Cannot be satisfied. No matter what happens, there's no satisfaction. It, is, it just, you just can't, it's always a complaint. Never good enough. And when you hear someone always complaining, it's never good enough. What that shows is a ins- an insatiable heart. Wow. And then MM. Does anybody know what MM stands for? How about motor mouth? <laughs> Very highly technical term, right? Motor mouth, motor mouth, motor mouth. You just can't stop talking. Now, I know that there are psychological conditions that go with that, and that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about, a self-centeredness that just constantly has to talk. Um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Did you know that the average person uses about 18,000 words a day? 18,000 words a day. There, there's people that in various modes of life get, bump that average up a little bit. I'm one of those. There's no doubt about it. Um, by the nature of, of my personality as well as my responsibilities and some of you um, are that some of you pull that average down um, you're not required to say a lot some of you wives wish he would say more um, and he doesn't but 18,000 words a day you know that's 54 pages of an average book you, you write 54 pages of an average book every day in your conversation I I, I just can't help but think of 1985 and listening to Run DMC, You Talk Too Much. I, I just, I, <laughs> some of you have no idea what that is, but <laughs> it's just what I think of. You talk too much. You never shut up. 
you just talk and talk. And, and, and very often what that can reveal is a, it's just a, an egocentric, self-centered mentality. When somebody can't be quiet and listen to somebody else. We, we come to these sins of the tongue because of the tongue is a great view into the heart. We can see that a fill it in, a sinful tongue reveals an unregenerate heart. A sinful tongue reveals an unregenerate heart. And an unregenerate heart has worthless religion and worthless religion is best seen in no salvation. So, look at verse 26 up there at the top of the page. But does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is what? Is worthless. They, there's no, there's no bridle on the tongue. How about the second test? or the second, excuse me, example. Verse 27, it's right there on the middle of your page. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. You see, this is loving others freely. When you're talking about visiting orphans and widows, you say, is it specific about orphans and widows? Does that mean that you're not saved if you haven't visited orphans and widows? Well, it, just like the only sin that condemn you and can reveal that you're that you're a sinner that's, that's unregenerate is not just the tongue. It can be your actions. It can be other things that you do. I mean, it, it can be the aim of your life. Maybe, maybe you don't have a verbose problem with your tongue, but there's other things too. That's kind of what James is doing. This is wisdom literature that James is giving. So this is, this is, these are a, a general example, though true in itself. But so not only the tongue, but this idea of visiting orphans and widows is pointing to a much bigger mentality. And the much bigger mentality is this, that there is a religion that is good and acceptable. It's, it has to do with loving others freely. It is seen in true love, expecting, fill, or, uh, I think I left it filled in for you, true love expecting nothing in return. Now, let me remind you that in the setting in which this was written, if you were an orphan, it's not like other people just took you in all the time. That wasn't an assumption, especially in the, in the, the world that they were in. You may, as an orphan, it may have been that you were not seen as legitimate, <coughs> quote unquote, which is a horrible term. <laughs> Perhaps your parents were not respected in society and they had too many children. So there were, there were many orphans that were in cities. There are modern cities today that have hundreds, thousands of orphans. There are some cities where, where the police go and just shoot them like dogs because of the problem of quote-unquote unwanted children. Children that no one is raising children that no one is caring for. That, that is much more the picture. We have orphans in America, but it's, it's very different in our setting than in many settings. We have orphans in this church room right now that were raised in foster care and have come to faith in Jesus and found that Jesus is, is the, the heart of, that they were looking for of a parent, that, the God, that God's Word says that He is a father to the fatherless. You see, God is on the side of the fatherless. God is on the side of the unwanted. God is on the side of that which is powerless and can't do anything. God is for the underdog that can't save himself. And that's the only reason that God is for me. Because I'm hopeless. And so when you're talking about visiting orphans and widows, you're talking about going and caring for someone and taking care of someone, ministering to someone, listen to this, that can't give anything back to you. 
You're not doing it for any reason other than the fact that it's the right thing to do and, it, and it's a blessing to them and it's needed. They're not going to, you, you, you go minister to the, the neighbor, well, you know, you could say, well, you know, I'm going to scratch his back. It's going to be over a period of time, you know, there may be a day when you need something back. Da, 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 so you're nice to this guy, you're nice to that, or you're, you're good to somebody at church, or you're good to somebody at work, you're good to somebody in your family, or something like that. But when you begin to reach out, and you begin to minister to people where you're never going to see it again. You're never going to get it back. And it's just because it's the right thing to do. That is what God is talking about. Because you see, God comes that while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. We were helpless. That is the nature of the gospel. That is the nature of God's love. And so he says, if you're really saved, you're going you're to love like God. And loving like God means that you love expecting nothing in return. Do you see what he's doing here? Look at verse 27 again, right in the middle of the page. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. You see, in this day and time, a widow was very often... She just had no status in society. It, it wasn't like America. Widows in America have, have a very, very different perspective. Now, it can be like that. It is possible. But in general, in that, in that society, I mean, there, there would be sometimes when widows had, had nowhere to live. I mean, the, the, the sheer poverty of everybody trying to scratch out an existence and having a little one-bedroom one house, and there they are in their one-bedroom house in Bethlehem or in Jericho or out in Nazareth somewhere, and then here comes another widow. Her husband got sick, and he died, or something happened, and I don't have enough to feed my own family. I don't have enough room on the floor for my own children. I'm sorry, lady. I can't help you. And when the whole society is kind of that destitute, there she is. She really can be out in the cold. She really can not be cared for. She can't go out and earn a, earn a wage as she gets older. There's, there's nothing that she's going to give back. She's not going to die and leave you an inheritance. Because she didn't have anything. That's the picture that James is giving. She can't love you back. So you going and you taking care of her means a lot to God. See, James is after a heart of obedience. So it means to, it's more than visit, or to stop, but, excuse me, the word visit is more than to just stop by, it's to go care for them. And it's, it's from the same idea in Matthew 25 where Jesus was talking about the sheep and the goats. And I don't have time to, for us to go read 1 John 2 and 1 John 3, but would you put a circle around that and read that before you go to sleep tonight? Go read 1 John chapter 2 and go read 1 John chapter 3 and see if, you, if it doesn't mirror James. 1 John and James are going hand in hand. He's saying, don't say you love God if you don't love your brother. If you don't love and serve, if you don't forgive your brother, if you don't care for your brother, if you don't live at peace with your brother, but you hate him or that you, you just... You don't have a heart of compassion toward him. Don't say you love God. The last one here, verse 27. I want you to see this. And he says, and to keep what... So this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father. To visit orphans and widows in their distress. And look at verse 27. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. The example three is loving God devotedly. You're recognizing that the God of heaven deserves you living for him not according to the things of this world not according to the things of this life but according to him you're living on his standard you're living for his glory not your own fill this in notice here with me why would it, why would you ever want to keep yourself unstained from the world what does that matter unstained from the world here's the picture our god he says i am not of this world Jesus clearly said, I, I created the world, but this fallen world that has rejected all that is good, holy, and right 
and just is a world unto itself that is lost in sin. And Jesus is saying, you guys are living in the world right now. You're in the world, but don't be of the world. He's saying, you can live in the world, but don't take on the world's values. Don't take on the world's, the world's lack of holiness. The word holy means to set apart. That's what it means, to, to not be like the rest. And so God is a holy God. He's not like anything that we've seen. He's not like anything in this world. And so he calls us to worship him, and he calls us to live for him, and he calls us to love him, and one of the ways that we do that is to mimic him. Notice and fill this in. Because if you are with God, then you are set apart from this world because he is set apart from this world. In 1 Peter 3.16, Peter quotes from Isaiah when he says, Be holy because I am holy. God calls us to be like him. And true religion, true faith in Jesus is a faith that is committed to not being in sync with the world but being in sync with God. Being in sync with what God thinks is important. Being in sync with what God thinks is cool. Being in sync with what God has called us to do having a different value system in a different scale. That's true religion. Now, when we look at these, the tongue and loving others freely and not being stained by the world, you could easily say, well, well who can be saved then? I mean, my goodness, haven't we all violated those? Yes, we have. When we fail in these areas, does it mean that I'm lost? It could. It, it sincerely could. And, and every person on the planet is called to evaluate themselves before the gospel, before God. So, so what do we do? Here's the difference. The difference is the response of your heart and behavior that results or that follows will reveal the true nature of your faith, either saving faith or not saving faith. When you have a problem with your tongue, when you see a need and you begin to, you're living your life truly loving and serving others. When you live your life seeking to be unstained by the world. You see, when we realize we have a problem with one of those, a true Christian repents of those things and runs to God. And listen to this, changes their behavior. So true Christians don't have tongues that are unbridled. If there's a tongue that's unbridled, you better watch out. You may not be saved. True Christians are concerned about loving other people who can't love them back. If you don't love others that don't love you, watch out. You may not be saved. True Christians are concerned about living a holy life, not going along with the flow that's around them. If you're not concerned about that, if you're just going and doing what everybody else is doing and just comparing yourself to others as opposed to listening, learning, and embracing what God says in His Word, you better watch out. You better look. You need to go look and see whether or not you have saving faith. And if you find yourself that you would say, well, I, I think that this Word is pointing and revealing to me my sin, there's one thing to do. It is run to the Savior and say, Lord, You are my only hope. Lord, I, I confess you as my only hope. Come and cleanse me of my sin and cause me, Lord, to live for you and not for myself or anyone else. Would you stand with me for prayer?